It's September 10th, 2020, and we're talking full-time bass fishing today. All this for you live right here on Bass 365. That's right, guys. Welcome to Bass 365's live cast, our second live cast. Today, we got a big show planned for you guys here. Ricky and I have just actually finished up our part of the season. For the most part, we got a couple more tournaments. I know there's a couple of FLW uh, Toyota Series tournaments to go to. The Bass Elites have a few more tournaments yet. But for the most part, the season is kind of wind down. And in fact, we've actually been introduced already. FLW has already announced the 2021 schedule and it looks like it's going to be a hectic one here at bass 365 we've committed we're going to make sure that we're at every flw event we're at every major league fishing bass pro tour event and we're going to try to make sure we're at every bass elite event as well it's going to be a busy season and it's going to be hectic absolutely hectic trying to make sure you do that and i think that's one thing a lot of folks don't really realize when you're talking about being on the road and on tour like this, just how much is entailed to be on the road that long. And you know what? Ricky and I might complain a little bit trying to find lodging, trying to find uh, the time and paying for the expenses of traveling. But we actually have it easy, easy when it's compared to some of these guys that are out there. And with our guest today, Major League Fishing Pro Jason Lambert, he knows better than anybody what it takes to be full-time bass fishing i'm talking full-time on the road in fact he's actually taken it a step above than most people have here so while ricky still plays around with his audio and we try hopefully get him back here i'm going to do it right now we're going to bring in the man major league fishing pro jason lambert what's up jason man i was sitting there listening to the intro and you're exactly right i'm sitting here in a campground at Pickwick back home, but you see in the background, I've got the camper back here. My wife and I made the decision um, last year in August, we were gonna put the house up for sale, put it on the market. Two days later, we had an offer and contract. We closed on it in October. We moved everything over into the fifth wheel and we have been on the road ever since. And to be honest, man, we are absolutely loving it. We haven't regretted one second of it. It's um, it works out great for fishing as well, because, you know, obviously it, it doesn't cost us any more or less to park this rig, you know, in one campground versus another. So we, we literally left what we call home over here in, um, in West Tennessee at Pickwick Lake, May the 30th. And we got back to Pickwick Lake um, August the 16th after the FLW tournament at Sandusky. So, you know, we... We, we skipped around. We went to Florida. We went to Chickamauga. We went to uh, Sturgeon Bay. Then between Sturgeon Bay and La Crosse, we went up to Escanaba, played on uh, Lake Michigan for a few days. And then, you know, from there over to La Crosse and then from La Crosse over to, to Sandusky Bay. So, you know, we, we enjoy it. It's just it's me and the wife. My, my wife, Ashley, and I have thoroughly enjoyed it. We've got two little schnauzers with us. I think you met them down in Florida. Yeah, definitely did. They, we uh, actually got to. I was we. I mean, I, my wife and I do that too. I mean, Jason, you yeah. know that. But we have a travel trailer, and we travel from event to event, uh, much like you do. So there is a bit of trouble finding the campgrounds because each one of these events brings a lot. Not just the anglers, not just the crew and the staff and the camera crews and everything, but a lot of fans that know where we're going to be, so they're going to show up. So those there's not near as many campgrounds as there seems to be hotels. That's for sure. No, there's not. And, and you know, it's, it's kind of weird. You, you think about certain places of the country and you don't, you don't really think about this until you start traveling and camping. You think, man, I can get a campground anywhere, but it's, it's no different than booking hotels or houses. A lot of guys stay in houses together, but you have to be real cognizant of where you're going because you run into the situation, especially in Florida from say January 1st up until April in Florida, it's almost impossible to find campsites because all snowbirders go down and and then it's uh, it just flips in the summertime so when you go up north you know up to escanaba up to sturgeon bay a lot of those places sandusky ohio a lot of those places those great lakes and all the northern lakes become they become 
you know, tourist spots. Absolutely. So you, you have to plan ahead. You have to make sure, you know, especially for us, we're in a 43 foot rig. So it's not, you know, we have to have 50 amp service and there's, you can't just put a 43 footer anywhere. So you have to be real careful about the sites, but that's just part of it. You know, the fishing, everybody sees the fishing. They, the, you know, they see the pretty that's magazines, it. they see the videos, they see all the stuff that me and Ricky shoot during, you know, down days where they think it's just, it's cool. You know, you get to go fishing, but man, there's a, there's a lot more to it than just going fishing. There's, there's an entire business side to it. Oh yeah. And, yeah. and not only that, now it's a lifestyle side to it. <laughs> really, it really is. And you know what? And I understand that, you know, they try to schedule these events kind of the same way, you know, where the weather is going to be warm. So in the, we start off in the early spring, sure. and of course, you're going to be in down south. Well, that's also where the snowbirds are going to want to be. And that's the same thing. Well, as yeah. the weather warms up through the rest of the season, we're going up north. Well, that's where the, north, the people are going to want to be as well. So it gets a little hectic. And it gets even worse like this last year when things like COVID get in the way and schedules get changed. So you got to make these uh, all these adjustments on the fly, much like you have to do when you're fishing, I'm sure. But uh, when you're looking for those campgrounds, you can't necessarily schedule to them so so quickly in advance or so far in advance when you're having to deal with, you know, COVID and rescheduling issues. Well, COVID was a whole different animal to itself. I mean, you know, everybody had their whole entire year scheduled out. We knew where we were going. You know, as soon as the schedule comes out, we all sit down and we try to book campgrounds because most of the places we go, you know, we've been there before and we know which campgrounds to stay at and vice versa. Same thing with guys with houses and hotels. So it's, you know, I'm, it's not any different for, for us than it is for them as far as that part of it goes. But, you know, you, you get everything booked and then, okay then COVID happens and then you have to cancel everything and then you run into the issues will, will this campground give you your deposits back or will it not and you know we end up having to do that a couple different times because you know we we rescheduled an event to st Clair with the flw uh pro circuit and then uh, because of michigan guidelines and all the the mess going on with with covid so they moved it over to sandusky so we had to cancel that campground find a place at sandusky so it you know it's it's just part of it, uh, you know, it, that's the part of this whole game that a lot of guys don't see is, is the just the logistics of getting from event to event, having a place to stay. Absolutely. You know, everybody sees the fishing, they see the pretty part, but they don't see a lot of the work. Like, I mean, they have no idea really what you guys do, what Mike and you do and Ricky, what you do, you know, behind the scenes. It's, it's a... Uh, you know, I, I'm really trying to figure out right now, Mikey, how we got Ricky to run camera for us because he can't even. It's, it's a struggle camera. tonight, Hammer. Ain't a lot. <laughs> hey, Jason, I have one question for you. Are yeah. The socks clean. Do what now? Are the socks clean? Very clean right now. <laughs> it can change in a couple of days, though. It very well could. <laughs> yeah, that's it. There are struggles when you're on the road, and I mean, I I live half the year in our in our camper as well. And I mean, you got the conveniences, but they're not the full-on conveniences that you got at home typically. I mean, I know I don't have quite the rig you got, and I've seen that rig; it's a beautiful rig. But uh, you know, being on the road, they're just not built like a house. So there's issues that are going to come up. And when you're out there, you got one thing that should be on your mind, and that's it, and that's tournament day. And I know how dedicated you are. So this is a, like you said, a side to the sport that a lot of people just don't actually see much like all the preparation and all the homework and all the other things that you got to do in each one of these tournaments, before each one of these tournaments, uh, let alone on the fly out there. So th I thought that was a good topic that we could talk about because I know, Jason, I got to meet you a couple times, and I know that you had, you know, actually committed to full-time RV life because it's just easier, easier on the travel and the schedules that you have to do each year. Well, it is, I mean, it is easier for the fishing schedule, but, you know, I'm going to take it a step further because there, there's a little bit of selfish part of it, too, because my wife and I love to travel. And, you know, with us not having children, and especially with the career that the career path that I've chosen, I mean, we're on the road all the time anyway. So, you know, we, we basically go from event to event during the season but you know coming up here and i don't know i'm gonna fish I, i've been on pickwick all day today we're, we're gonna fish a charity event here for uh Le Bonner on saturday and then i'm gonna fish a bfl two day here next weekend and then um 
I've got to go to Texas uh, October the second, third, fourth, somewhere along in there for the Major League Cup, the Latin, for my Major League Fishing Cup. But once that's over and we get back home to Pickwick, I think we're going to leave here October the sixteenth, and we're going to we're going to bounce over to East Tennessee to the mountains. We're going to hang out for about a month or so and watch the colors change, and then. You know, we're going to swing back through Pickwick with the family for Thanksgiving for a few days, and then we're going to point it south, and we're going to spend uh, the whole month of December down in the Keys. So, oh man, uh, there's, it's, there's a little that's, that's pretty awesome. to it too. There, that is a really nice perk to be able to do it. And you know, honestly, selfishly, that's kind of why we decided to do it. We yeah. could stay in hotels, and I know Ricky's famous for bouncing hotels and and kind of last minute finding the place to stay out there. He's been doing it for years and years. But hey, I mean, you like to no, travel. No, 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 Ricky's famous for, hey, man, you got somewhere I can sleep tonight? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't quite want to bring that yeah, out, but it's right. true. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, we you know, we were just on the road doing all the FLW Super Tournaments as well as the final Major League Fishing Bass Pro Tour event in Sturgeon Bay. We about, you know, my wife and I, and, of course, any time we had in between, we did our best to travel and see the sights. Her family's from North Dakota. We drove all the way up to Bismarck. Spent yeah. a couple of days up there. Hit South Dakota on the way. We went down yeah, to Kansas they, to spend some time with people. What I'm not saying is they have a toddler. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah I have an extra. Right yeah. there, right? Trip yeah. is the man. My, yeah, we have our, our son Trip is just going on two years old. Uh, he's not quite there yet or whatever, but the kid is to, actually uh, in less than two years, he's been, I, I forget the exact numbers, but something like 22 different states now. Uh, he's been to 17 national parks, two countries, and two provinces as well on top of that. So right. that's pretty incredible. So, guys, if that gives any of you people watching just a little bit of an insight on how much travel this job and this career for all of us actually entails, yeah. uh, you know, and you know what? We're this close, this close to going full-time RV as well, too, because it just seems like it might be a little bit better for us. It, it's it's not it's not a terrible life. I mean, Ricky, you've hung out with us at the sure, absolutely a lot, and you know, obviously, you don't have to have a rig like we got to go do it. But you know, once we decided to sell our house um, and be full full time in it, you know, we don't have the toddler, but we got you know we got the two we got the two pups with us and and me and Ricky. Yeah, we got <laughs> yep. Ricky. And, you know, so it's it's we 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 have thoroughly enjoyed it. We've thoroughly enjoyed seeing a lot of places and you know used to when when you're staying in hotels all the time or whatever you know you you don't want to spend that extra eight nine hundred bucks a week to stay somewhere between tournaments when it's cheaper to buy a couple tanks of fuel home and a couple tanks of fuel right. back so now it, it kind of slows us down i mean when i whenever i whenever i book room or book campsites now i usually come in at least a day maybe two days early that way you're there. You got time to work on tackle. If you got issues, like you're saying, Mikey, I mean, it's a camper. It's rolling yeah. up and down the road. You got stuff you got to work on. You know, you're all the time working on stuff on the boat. You're all the time working on. I mean, it's always something you got to do. So we try to schedule out, you know, at least a day, maybe two days in advance. And we always try to stay a day later. And it's just easier where you can just unwind, you know, Plus, again, we're just trying to make sure Ricky ain't sleeping in his car, too. You know? <laughs> yep, yep. We all got to look after. Ricky does so much for all of us, I'm sure. We don't mind helping him out every once in a while. <laughs> That's for sure. Golly, but, day, man. It's not that <laughs> Hey, man, you don't need enemies when you got friends like us, brother. That's right. No <laughs> doubt. I take a beating every time. Man, you know, so, on, on a serious note, Jason, the FLW – tour schedule came out today or the pro yep. circuit schedule came out today that looked to me at first glance like it fits into your wheelhouse pretty good huh i'm all in man like i'm i mean i'm as as long as everything works out with you know once our schedule comes out with mlf right i'm i'm fishing both circuits period right. I mean, i'm 100 percent committed to fish mlf and flw you know again we're full-time in a fifth wheel so it it honestly doesn't cost us a dime more to park it any place than it does another. So I might right. as well be fishing. So, you know, and, you know, I love Major League Fishing. Major League Fishing has done a lot for my career. I've, I've had a couple of tough seasons there. I've had a couple of good events there, too, but I've had, you know, overall points point standings in, the, in, the, in, in MLF for two years. It's not been great for me. But it's it's 
I, I, I buy into the, the program. It's it right. is the, the greatest thing that's ever happened to the sport of bass fishing. There's no question in my yeah. mind about that. It, it's going to progress our industry further than anything has ever done. It's, you know, we, we sat there with BASS and I'm, I've got nothing against those guys. I love a lot of them guys over there. FLW was where my teeth, I mean, it's where I cut my teeth. I mean, that's where I grew up. So I, I love all those guys too. And the five fish deal is still, you know, for me personally, that's what I grew up doing. That's what I love to do. And that's, you know, I'm looking so forward. I mean, I loved going and fishing those super tournaments this, this year. And I'm looking so forward to doing it next year. Major League Fishing, I still think, is is the engine, and, and we're the train, and, and you know, it's, you know, is, does the tail wag the dog? Does the dog wag the tail? We don't know, but we're all one big family, and I want to fish all of it. That's that's my plan moving forward for 2021. You know, my, my wife's all in on it. My sponsors are all in on it. So as long as everything works out logistically and, and you know, the numbers work out for the 150 for the FLW Tour, and right. I'm 100. percent I'm in. I'm fishing both of them. So you mentioned in that conversation your sponsors, and there there are a couple of them that I want to touch on real quick. Um, one of them's Hardcore. Let's talk about Hardcore. Explain to it what you know, what it is, and you know, some of your thoughts on it. And hopefully, you brought a couple of baits you can show us. Oh yeah, I've got some stuff. You know, I've always got something tied on. <laughs> you know, so hardcore is is rel- It's not relatively new. It's brand new to the U.S. market. I mean, everybody has known Yozuri for a long, long, long time, and and Yozuri is a Japanese brand that has been a great brand, a phenomenal brand for decades. And you know, you've you've also heard of Duel in the past. You know, you saw D U E L Duel, which was right. was the original hardcore company, but it was also a Japanese company. So. Hardcore itself is still the same family as Deal Hardcore and Yozuri, but the Hardcore line is a line that we have developed for the American bass fishing market. I mean, it, it, it's a product that, that myself, I've, I've spent a lot of time on, um, Spencer Sheffield, there's, you know, there's a few of us that, you know, and a lot of you guys watching will think, you know, Japanese products, blah, 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 you've all been through all that in the past, but they, they hired a couple of rednecks to work on the baits. So you got myself. Talk about redneck ingenuity, right? <laughs> so you got myself and Spencer Sheffield that, that have been, you know, the, the primary voices on what we do and what we what we don't do. And, you know, and they brought some of the stuff over from Yozuri and we kind of tweaked it a little bit. But, you know, we're, we're working on some, some deep Tennessee River stuff. We're working on a crank seven right now, which is going to be a 25 foot crankbait. You know, we're working on a crank five plus, which is going to be an 18 to 22 foot crankbait. So we've got a lot, a lot of stuff that, that's in development, but they've already got some stuff that's, that's proven. I mean, it's, you know, I just got a box and I wish I had them with me. They're in storage, but I just got a brand new box of 130 hardcore jerk baits. That's, it's crazy good looking which i don't really need them at pick week this week fishing the grass tournament so i don't have them with me but there, there's just a lot of look really 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 cool little things they got this right here i mean my camera's backwards guys i'm left-handed so it's hard anyway this this is called a noisy n-o-i-z it's a weight bait but it has a propeller on the back of it so Ricky said, hey, grab a couple rods. Well, this is the stuff that I've got tied on to fish the Tennessee River right now in the fall. It's The water temperature still 87, 88 degrees, but you guys that ever fish around grass mats, especially in the fall, you, you see those big fish, they come up you know, in the edge of the grass mat and they won't eat anything. They ain't never seen this dude before. And right. They're going to see a lot of it this weekend, but it's a jointed wake bait, but it has a prop on it. It, it basically is a top water that you just have to see it in the water and ricky you've seen it we we've yeah we've, i was we've, just getting ready to say i think we have a video somewhere on that thing yeah i'll try to hunt it down and get it posted on on bass 365 and our social outlets in the next day or so but if you don't think this bait is it will work and it's cool go to hardcore's web to instagram facebook whatever and look at the promotional video we did when we came out with the the icast stuff i was throwing this bait in a bluegill pattern down in Florida back in March. And 
we we went out tyler from from uh yoziri hardcore went out with us and we did some filming and the first bite we got that morning and we didn't even know this had happened until he went back and started editing but i was throwing this bait and i caught two and a half pounder you know it wasn't a giant but when he went back and slowed down the footage there was a four pounder trying to eat it out of his mouth in the video <laughs> And, and they end up using that clip as like the, you know, the, the highlight clip of, of the introduction video for the ICAST stuff. So they like this thing and, and it's anywhere they'll eat top water, they'll eat this thing. But, you know, hardcore is the, the thing that I like about them the most is it's number one, it's great products. It has a weight transfer system that is patented by hardcore Yozuri. You can throw that one, the, even the 110 jerk baits you can throw a mile on a bait caster because of that weight transfer system every one of the baits has it the paint schemes are fantastic they got good hardware they got good hooks right out of the pack you know how many times have we all went and bought a crankbait that we love you pull it out of the pack you take the hooks off you throw them in the garbage and you put new hooks on it you right. don't have to do that when they yeah. get stuff. that's awesome well, Jason, when you coming down after, you know, you said you're on your way to the Florida Keys, you're going to be passing right by my house. So make sure you drop off or at least stop by and let me throw that wake bait for a little bit. Hey, that it, way, it, it, it's we might be a guy you can get one from there, Mikey. I, yeah, I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> Got to be some extra little perks to doing that right. every once in a while. Absolutely you know? right, man. That's right. But no, I mean, I, a bait like that, it looks fantastic. I know personally how well wake baits work down here in Florida. And I like the size of that one, too. That's another thing. A lot of topwater baits, you know, they're a little too small for our Florida bass down yeah. here. They like, big, they're, they like big baits. They eat 12-inch shiners, so they're going to eat that. The heck you know, that. when we were at uh, Okeechobee for um, the the MLF event this year, I, I had talked to Marty Stone. That he called me the day before, which, I mean, I've had some really good history at Okeechobee. And so they, you know, they called, hey, what how, what you think is going to happen? And, and I told Marty that um, – Dude, I'm fishing. I'm fishing to catch them on this white bait that nobody's ever seen, nobody's ever heard of. And he's like, "What?" And I thought, "Yeah, dude, I'm telling you, this thing's yeah. like it. And and I did. I caught them on it in practice. And you know, the first day I caught, you know, like three, four and a halves on it the first day. And then I ended up taking the hooks off of it and throwing it the rest of practice. And I had 15, 20, 30 blow ups a day on it. But I mean, if you remember that event, it, it got a got a little windy on us. Yeah, man. So we yeah. didn't. You know, that's the other thing about a wake bait. You, you need relatively flat water. And, you know, we still end up having a good event there. I, I caught them. I caught them on a vibrating jig for the most part. But it, it I was just, man, I was you, looking you and everybody that else. deal. And that wind started blowing. And, oh, well. That's, a, that's so, great. Jason, two other things that I wanted to specifically touch on tonight. Um, duck it a lot of new things coming out you got you know several rods that will be introduced this year in your signature series um we've got some videos for those that will be coming out soon yeah. and uh you know we talked the other night when we, when we were here with casey scanlon about uh the resource and preserving the the resource and uh these five fish weigh-ins how they can be so hard on the fish and uh you've got a product that you work with a, a a plastic company that yeah. is changing the game. So if you could just touch on those two quickly, that would be awesome. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I'll start by talking about five fish limits. I mean, five fish limits are, it's what built the world of bass fishing. The sure. only reason all three of us are sitting here having a conversation with everybody else out there is Amen. because we started with five fish limits. With that being said, at one time, the rotary telephone was a freaking awesome thing too. <laughs> That's I mean, true. very true. You know, it's, progress happens in our world whether we want it to or whether we don't you either you either get on board and you stay with it or you get left behind so you know major league fishing is is advancing the sport now with uh, also with that being said everybody doesn't have the capability of doing that now i mean it's just it's not financially responsible for you know the bfls to go out and do that and sure. not, you know or club tournament or whatever at some point, I think there's going to be an app of some kind where every tournament that we fish will be some kind of catch, weigh, and release event. But there's there's a couple things. I mean, BioBait, number one, is is a company that is a 100% plant-based product. It is a plastic company. We build plastics for, you know, 
any circumstance you want, whether it's walleye fishing, bass fishing, what whatever whatever you do in the world of fishing, BioBait has a product for you. It's not a biodegradable product. It is a hydrodegradable product, which means I can take a BioBait plastic out of a package and I can lay it on the front deck of my boat and 10 years from now, it'll still be laying there. But if I throw that bait into the water or a fish comes up and jumps and slings the bait off the hook and it goes into the water, it's hydrodegradable. So what ends up happening in about, a, uh, I mean, it varies on the size of the bait, obviously, and the thickness of the bait. But anywhere from, you know, two weeks to four weeks, there's nothing left of that. It disintegrates back into that, that's the awesome. bait product. So it is 100% environment friendly but it's not you know i want everybody thinks about biodegradable it's not biodegradable because that's that degrades in the air it has to be in the water to degrade so that's what kind of makes it special as well so you can't throw the same worm for a month it's going to go to waste in the water that's <laughs> but right. at the same time if you left it in your boat for two years it's still going to be there but it's very environment friendly it's a very good product. The, the way that they build the product out of the plant-based stuff, they can infuse a lot of sin into it. Ricky, you've, you've grabbed a hold of a couple of them are doing shoots. You're like, man, I need a towel. Let's think, but it's, it's real, it's real oily. It's, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's what you want for, for fishing. But the last thing I'll say about five fish tournaments is we as anglers can control 95% of fatality. We have to take more time as an angler. And, and, you know, I grew up on the Tennessee River, so I, I'm used to catching them deep. I'm used to catching them in heat, and I'm used to taking care of them. So I learned a long, long, long time ago how to fizz. And, yeah. you know, there's this, uh, there's a company out there, and I don't even know exactly who makes the, the, the needle, but you can buy it at Tackle Warehouse. It's called a men's, uh, a Ben's Mender. And it's a needle. It costs about seven or eight bucks go youtube it man go go take some time figure out how to fizz a fish it's, it's right. not hard at all once you really figure out how to do it i can do it in 15 seconds and be back fishing so are you, are you down the down the throat kind of guy or are you absolutely uh, down the throat right. every time down the throat it's so easy the problem if you go through the side me and lucas had this conversation up at um at uh start uh where would where did we just leave from sandusky right and he always goes through the side now i i mean if you're comfortable going through the side then go through the side but the problem with going through the side is if you miss there's a lot of organs in the side that you can hit if you go through the mouth it's pretty cut and dry you you find the crushers you got two crushers in the mouth you go a quarter inch above them and straight in and the easiest thing to do is before you poke them you just dip your needle if you get the if you get the bins mender you put it in the water and that needle right. will fill up with water and when you pop that fish you see the bubbles coming out you don't want to let all the air out of the fish if you let all the air out of the fish then it's just going to go to the bottom it's going to die so i usually give them five six seconds and you know just enough to what you know the side will come down a little bit but with that being said if I'm largemouth fishing, I almost never fizz one. Almost never. Yeah. I use, uh, fl they call them flip clips, which I make my own. I just use one ounce egg weights, go to Lowe's and buy alligator clips, you know, electrical clips, put them together. I've got right. 30 of them on boat right now. And, you know, as soon as I catch a fish, I close my live wells off. I fill my live wells completely full of water. I put a bag of ice in them to start just to cool them off. And then I take, you know, G juice from TH Marine, get yeah. the water conditioned. It does, if that water is conditioned and cool and you got chemical in there like a G juice, if you if you put them fish in there and they don't turn over on their side, you never have to do anything to them. But if they turn over on their side, if you put a couple clips on them, you know, if it's a three pounder or less, you put one clip on it, it'll flip it back upright. A couple hours, that fish fixes itself. Right, because right. the only the only reason that they roll over on the side is because they come out of deep water really fast and they don't have time for their air bladder to adjust. Right, so right. If you put them, you know, if you put clips on them and you turn them upright, and they're sitting in that cool live well water with chemical on them and aerators running, then that fish will actually fix itself. It will actually, its bladder will come back down. 
when you turn him loose, he'll swim away. But if, right. you leave them, if you leave them laying in that live well, I don't care if your water temperature is 50 degrees. If you leave them in there turned on their side all day long, that fish will not live. So you've got to yeah. get them turned up right. You've got to get them turned over. I think that's a great, great point. Absolutely. And a lot of these tournaments, have, especially the last few, have been on really big bodies of water where yeah. it gets really rough. But you got to, re- if it was, you know, in the five fish tournaments, you got a long run back. That fish yep. gets beat up real a lot in that yep. in there. But I, what I love best about the bio bait that you were talking about is how fast it can break down. And we've all seen, I mean, I just caught one. I actually just put a video up. A super, super skinny bass that yep. you know was not healthy. Something was wrong. It was a good four-pound bass, but it probably weighed about a pound and a half by the time I got it. And I guarantee if I would have cut that belly open, it was full of plastics. Probably it was full of plastic. We all lose a plastic, you know, a fish rips it off, it falls off on a cast, whatever happens. That plastic doesn't it, it sits there and it bloats and it bloats. And it just it, it, if you've seen a Sanko that's been sitting in the water for two, two, three weeks, it doesn't look anything like a Sanko anymore. It looks like a half a snake or something. Yeah. But, I've seen them. I've, I've literally seen them where you catch, you know, our, I mean, not even on the fish, but you, I mean, you'll hang a line or something and pull it up and it'll have an old brush hog or whatever on it. Right. Instead of being, you know, five inches long, it's nine inches long and it's big exactly. as a rope. And, and I've actually caught fish where they'll spit it up in the live well and it'll be a great big worm or whatever. And, and exactly. I've seen them, you know, you catch them with something hanging out of their bottom and you pull it out and it's a plastic worm that was a six inch trick worm that's now nine inches long. So, right. I yeah. mean, it's there, there's, um, you know, one of the things, and, and I've said this um, uh, many times and, 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 and I try, I've tried every time I get a chance to talk to high school kids or college kids, I, I, I try to, say this as as plainly as i can but in a way that everybody will understand you take a lake like kentucky lake i mean it was the greatest fishery that's that's ever been for 10 15 years i mean it was the best tournament fishing organ tournament fisherman fisherman's lake in the world right and it it just got fished to death and the problem was it's not that it got fished to death if if you catch them I don't care if it's a hundred degrees and you catch them and you turn them right back loose and swim right back down, that fish is fine. But when you bounce him around in a live well, just like you said, Mickey, I mean, just like us at Sandusky, I killed, I killed a fish the first day and I killed a fish the second day, but I was making, you know, and you were doing everything. you long possibly run. Could. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, I was putting ice on, you know, I was putting ice in my live wells. I had clips on the fish. I had, you know, I stopped on my way back twice to make sure my live wells were full. But I mean, when you get in four to six footers for 50 miles, I mean, you're just, it's, it's right. not just killing the fish, it's killing you too. But I mean, you know what, you know what it's doing to you and you can hold on. Imagine that fish in the live well that's got absolutely nothing to hold on to. Well, and there's other things you can do in rough, rough water tournaments too. I mean, a lot of guys go buy the noodles, you know, the, the right. swimming pool noodles. Yeah, and lay them across. And lay them on top. I don't do that. I've got two throw cushions just throw cushions that you have to have in your boat required by law and they they're the perfect size once you fill your live wells up you put them in the live wells and it keeps the fish from hitting the top now you can't really do much about the bottom or the size but you know the latches on the top of your lids and stuff like that for damage so put those throw cushions in there and you know as much as we want to take care of them we're going to kill one every now and then that's that's just part of it right you know if, if we went by what you know biologists say we should be eating some of them anyway i mean that's oh, yeah. they, they put limits out there because of numbers for that's a reason. i'm not going to eat one so if we kill one then you know I, we don't want to kill one but it's not the end of the world they put limits on these fish for a reason because they can overpopulate deer can overpopulate Absolutely. everything yeah. can overpopulate so you yeah. just take care of them the best you can take care of them if you lose one every now and then, it's not the end of the world. But I, I do think Major League Fishing is, is, is making headway. And, and I, I do think at some point there's going to be an app. And, and I think that five years down the road, ten years down the road, who knows what it is. 
we won't need a live well in a bass boat anymore. So right. And that's I, I, I would love to see that. I would love to see that, and I would love to see, like I said before, a combination of the two. And I know Major League Fishing is going to try to do it where we got a big show at the end where all of us fans can actually interact with you guys and see, you know, I don't know how exactly they're going to do it, but to have that way in kind of expo feeling. Oh, and we, we talked about it the other night, Mikey. We did it year one of the Bass Pro Tour with the – activations all the anglers came across stage they were there to talk it was amazing COVID changed that all yeah. hopefully yeah. 2021 we get can back get back to that do you remember jason i mean you know oh, everybody, yeah, yeah. everybody went across the stage it was like a big party right i mean everybody came in we drove through you, you had you had time to talk about sponsors you had time to meet and greet right. fans you had a lot a lot of time and, and you're right i mean this this whole coronavirus thing has has not just i mean it's changed everybody's life it's not just changed our deal with fishing but you know and there's some things that we've discussed with major league fishing i mean a lot of guys are like well heck we don't want to come to you know the post game if we know who won and, and there's some things we've talked about you know you know do we right got the feed off for the last hour i mean you know there's yeah. things we can do yeah. to Kind of like what FLW does. They stop the live yeah. feed at like 2 o'clock or something yeah. like that. So there's still a big guess. Like, did so-and-so catch him big at the right. end? You know, did he jump from 10th to 1st? Or, you know, so they still have that kind of thing. I'm sure there's a way that it can be – where it works on both ends. Well, you know? I, I can assure you, being – knowing Boyd the way that I know Boyd and, and Jim and those guys with Major League Fishing, you know, there's – we know it's not perfect. And, and we knew last year it wasn't perfect. And, right. and we've, we probably had more changes from 19 to 20 than, than BASS or FLW have had changes in 20 years. And Correct. so it's a lot of it is, is fan interaction. I mean, we, we got, we've got to figure out a way once we're through this whole coronavirus and COVID BS mess that we're in, <laughs> once we can get through all of this stuff and figure out, that everybody can actually get back together again. Right. Then, you know, we, we do have to address fan interaction because I, I know I've, you know, today, man, I'm putting in at a little bitty ramp down in Waterloo, Alabama, and I got two or three guys comes up and wants to take pictures. And I love that. I, I love that as much as the fans love that. Right. So I enjoy it. And I know, I know, you know, 95% of our anglers love that just as much as the fans love it. So there's, we got to figure that out, and we will. I mean, the one thing I'll say I mean, is it's a powerful team behind you guys. Oh, dude, that's all I'm gonna say about you it. You know, the the guys that, that I will I will honestly say this: the the if if I decided that I was going to leave bass fishing tomorrow and go back into the world of sales and marketing and everything that I'd done before I got into bass fishing, I don't want to go to work for them guys because right. those oh. it's it is some of the smartest people, business people. You know, Boyd and Gary and Jim and all those guys, Brubaker, everybody over there, It and Cronky. I mean, obviously, look at what Stan Cronky's done in his career. So it is it is one of the smartest management teams of people that I have ever worked with, and I've worked with a lot of different companies through my career. And trust me, we know that there's some things that we need to work on as a organization, as, as Major League Fishing, not, not necessarily for us, but for you, the fan. But as – as the fan too, it, it, it makes our life better. I mean, you have a bad day and you come off the water and you hadn't caught them and people come up and start wanting to take pictures and it takes your mind off of you wanting to kill somebody at that point. In time. <laughs> so it's, you know, we, we love the interaction. I, I promise you as, as a, as a professional angler, I love interacting with the fans and signing autographs and taking pictures and, and doing all that. I'm just, I'm looking forward to the day that we can get back to doing it. Absolutely. I think it's a huge part. It's a huge part of the sport too. You know I mean? And that's a big reason, part of the reason why some of you guys get to the level that you're at because you understand that there's a whole other side to the sport than just being an excellent fisherman. I mean, I bet you half of you guys, at least half of you guys, will probably admit there's better fishermen out there than you. But you understand the business and the social aspect of it better than most. And you can actually... Stand up in front of a camera, and you can stand and talk to people for hours on end about the sport of fishing because you're that passionate about it. And that's a, I think that's just something that makes it that much more special. All of us, from a fan perspective, 
to see guys that are just loving that part of it. It's your passion, and we can tell. I like that a lot. Ricky and I have had this conversation, and, and when I started off early in my career, I, I had this conversation with a guy. Y'all may have heard of his name before. It's, it's Kevin Van something. Kevin Van Dam. Yeah. yeah. So this Kevin. <laughs> Kevin. Sounds kind of familiar. I haven't heard it in a while, though. Yeah. Kevin is uh, – I've known Kevin a long time, way before I started fishing professionally. And um, when I started this deal, Kevin told me, he said, look, he said, there's one thing you need to remember about, about bass fishing. He said, bass fishing is – uh, the only part, the fishing part of bass fishing is only good to get you recognized. And once you get recognized, it's what you do with it after that. Now, I, I love the competition. I, I still, I, I absolutely love takeoff, blast off in the mornings and going fishing. I love it. I, and, and the day that I don't love that anymore, I probably won't do this anymore. But as as a guy that came out of the business world it made a hundred percent sense what kevin said to me and yeah. you know I, we spend a lot of time you know working for you know garmin blazer and ducket and and all the companies that that make this possible not just for me but for a lot of the industry so you spend a lot of time working and doing things that that most people that just think fishing's just fishing i mean fishing is not 10% of what we do. I mean, we love the fishing, but I mean, Ricky can tell you, Mikey, I mean, we spend so much time, you know, shooting video, you know, doing you know, whatever. I mean, it's doing stuff behind the scenes and, and, but I thoroughly enjoy it. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. There's, there's no way that I would, I would want to go back and sit in an office, you know, like I, like I did for 11 years and, and no. sales, but no, I've been there too. I started there just like everybody else. I mean, I had a career before this is too. Uh, but you know, I say to Ricky all the time, like I'm blessed, blessed to be part of this world. And I'm not going to give it away for nothing. You know what I mean? Like I, you had to work real hard to get to this level and you got to continue to work real hard to stay at this level. And uh, you know what I mean? But you, you got to be thankful and, blessed and, and, you know, sit back and say, man, we are blessed to be where we are and, and doing this every day for a living. We're a hundred percent blessed. We all are. I mean, and, you know, some of my best friends that I that I've got to this day, like like Ricky sitting there, are people that I met through fishing. I mean, you know, I, and the funny thing is, I've I've got good friends of mine that I grew up with that are still good friends of mine. But I promise you, I mean, Ricky, I talk to you more, and and like Cody Meyer. I mean, some of the guys that have become really good personal friends of mine, I met through the fishing world, and and this. We're a family out here. That's the other thing a lot of people don't understand. Like, you know, yeah, we're in competition. I mean, every time we put the boat in the water, I want to freaking kick Cody's hind in. But at the same time, you know, all day on Score Tracker, the first thing that I want to, you know, what do you need from Score Tracker? Well, how's Cody doing? You know, I mean, that's just, that's exactly. just, you, you make friends and, and they become some of your closest personal friends. But it's, it's because we're all working for the same goal. And the sure. same goal for us is to create a larger industry for us. Yeah, because it's financially better for us. But it's also to create a better product for everybody that's watching and, and listening and to what we're doing right now. And, and all the guys that follow us all on Instagram, Facebook, whatever, social media. If, if we can't make our lives better, then we can't make your experience better. Sure. So if your experience gets better then we make more money, basically. <laughs> so, Absolutely. It, it's Absolutely. And Ricky and I can attest to it being on this end of it. We work with your UA English, but we work with your sponsors as well. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's got to be a nice, coherent mesh for everything to work well. And the harder we work for you, the harder you work for us, the harder we work for the company, and everybody looks better all together. But the end product is the people that are seeing this, you know, well, the, fans, the fans and the people that that are looking up to you to try to learn and be entertained at the same time. I think there's a big misconception too. You know, everybody, a lot of the outside world thinks like there's this there's this struggle or whatever that you know, major league fishing and and bass we don't get along or or FLW and bass yeah. don't get along or whatever that. But I can tell you 100% for a fact, everybody listen to this, please listen to what I'm saying. The Put stronger, you more full screen when you say that. The, <laughs> the, strong, the stronger BASS is, the stronger FLW is, the stronger Major League Fishing is, the stronger our industry is. 
So trust me, I'm pulling for FLW, I'm pulling for bass, I'm pulling for Major League Fishing. I want all three organizations to be as successful as can be imagined. The bigger the industry is, the bigger it is for everybody involved, not just the fishermen, but for everybody that's watching this, that's buying products, that we're, you know, companies are integrating new products, their, their R&D departments get bigger. It, it just gets better for everybody involved if the whole industry is strong. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with that 100%. And there's always going to be misconceptions out there. There's uh, a million rumors that yeah. fly. The fact is most people that are saying that don't understand because they're not here and they're not yeah. familiar with it. Uh, so you, you, you hear rumors just like we know what happens in the media out there today. What you hear is not always necessarily what you should base your opinions on, um, you know, but you guys, you, you put it absolutely right. You're a big family out there. And I've really grown to appreciate that in my short time that I've been working with you guys out on tour, uh, how much you guys have our family. You travel together, your kids grow up together, your wives become friends as well. And, you know, you said you're out there to compete. And when tournament morning starts and your takeoff, you, you got your game face on, you're there to compete, but it's like a sibling rivalry between you and your good friend now. Yeah. You know I mean, you're, you, you, you want to beat your brother, but you're yeah. going to love your brother no matter what. But you, you're also pulling for that guy too, though. I mean, it, yeah. it, obviously you want to do well, but you, you want everybody, you want all, all of the people that all your friends, you want all your friends to succeed. You want everybody to, I mean, you want everybody that you know to be in the top ten. It don't always work that way, obviously, but no. you know, and it, it can't. Yeah, no, no, it can't. But I mean, if if you're having a bad day, I mean, it's you, you, literally you're pulling for for your friends because it it it, right. it is a it is a it's a it's a tight knit group. And and you know, and I'm not saying all eighty of our guys are tight tight knit because because they're not because everybody has their groups of of guys. But sure, of course. Know, the guys that you end up traveling with, like, you know, like, like Cody and, and David Walker and Mike McClellan and, 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 you know, a lot of the guys that count, you know, yeah, right. Red high. I mean, you know, you, you end up becoming really close to those guys and my wife and David's wife have become really close and they, you know, when we're Jason, out, are you sure you want to include height in that group? Well, now that is true. That's, that's <laughs> let me back, up a little bit. back up a little bit on this. <laughs> But I mean, we, guys, we love Brett Height. He's Evergreen Pro. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's an awesome, awesome, good, awesome good friend guy. of Bass 365. But I, I think what you're saying, and it makes a lot of sense, is yeah. that, you know what? doesn't matter if you're on Bass Elites or if you're fishing Major League matter. Fishing or if you're fishing FLW. All you guys kind of came up through that same path. You guys have grown up together. You've yep. fished together. You competed against each other. But you became friends all along, no matter which way you went yep. with that. And it doesn't matter where you're fishing nowadays. I know, I know you're still friends, and I know that you'd still be happy to fish against each other again. Just like these FLW Super Tournaments that just happened. We got you Major League Fishing uh, Bass Pro Tour guys fishing with the FLW Pro Circuit again. And I know for a fact, because uh, Casey just told us, it was really good to see a lot of you guys and actually be with you guys for one last time. So I we definitely know you're a big family no matter what. Now, I know we're going on 48 minutes here, so we've been going for a while, and there's still yeah. a few things we definitely want to touch yeah. here on here. And you brought it up several times. Uh, you mentioned the name, and Ricky brought it up. But we really want to talk about these signature rods, these Jason Lambert signature bucket rods. I've seen them. They look awesome. Tell us about them, and tell us why I need to go get some of those, because I know I do. So with Ducket Fishing last year, we you know we had the Wide Eye Series for a long time that was the original um, – I guess signature series rod. So in 2019, we, we got together down at Gunnersville, the whole team got together and we basically, we took the lineup of rods and we said, okay, you know, what's your strengths? What's your strengths? You know, KJ, Timmy Horton, Boyd, myself, Rojas we, and, and Wheeler. We all kind of, we all kind of chose the rods that, that were what we like to do. So, you know, I've got three different signature rods, and I'm not sure what the numbers are for everybody in, in the group, but we all got two or three signature rods that, that we developed. You know, so we started out taking, you know, for me, I did three different, I did a, a, obviously a big swim bait rod, and that's base, basically off of my Castaic, you know, the, the Katana stagger head, the scrounger type head, big one ounce swim bait head that we've had so much success with. So I, I built a 7-Eleven swim bait rod, 
and then I built a 7.6 medium heavy, which, you know, we didn't call it a cranking rod, but it's, it's what I like to crank, you know, like a 20 foot crankbait with like, you know, even, even our hardcore four plus it's, it's got a fast enough tip. I throw even the four plus on it and, and that's what I'll throw like our five plus. On it. So uh, we didn't call it a cranking rod because it's a very, it's a, it's a very, it's a rod you can use for a lot of different things. You know, you can throw a jig on it, you can throw a trap on it. it it's got a fast enough tip, but it's got enough backbone in it. I'm, I'm a whip caster. So I like to throw, I like to, to rip a rod when I throw it. So I wanted something with enough backbone I could throw it. But the, the other, the other rod I did was a rod that I just had a lot of success with up at, uh, at, at Sandusky was my spinning rod. And you know, I did a seven, two medium heavy spinning rod. And a lot of guys don't really look at me and my style of fishing as a spinning rod kind of guy. But the, the truth about it is fishing deep offshore structure on Tennessee river, you gotta have a spinning rod. You're either drop shotting or throwing, you know, a little grub or a little, like a two, eight type swim bait. I mean, there's a lot of stuff we do when these fish get real hard to catch out deep that you, you have to, you have to downsize to a spinning rod because you can't efficiently throw you know, a quarter ounce grub head with a, you know, a three inch grub on a seven foot bait casting rod and reel. Right. You know, you need lighter line, you need to be able to cast it further, you need more control fighting the fish because it's a lot wire hook. So that was the three rods I did. And, you know, I've got, I, I've had a lot of, a lot of people come back and talk to me about this. You know, this is a 7-Eleven, which I've been on Pickwick today, so it's it's not my scrounger head in the fall. This is actually a, a big giant ounce and a quarter vibrating jig head with a, a cast back jerky J on it. But yeah, this is my 7-Eleven heavy pro series rod. And it, it's actually a pretty versatile rod too. You can flip, you can punch up to an ounce and a half on this rod if you want to, but it's still got enough tilt on it that like throwing that scrounger head, you know, the stagger head, that when a fish eats it, you don't just jerk it away from it. You, you've, to me, every rod that I've done, all three of my rods are, are, are one thing. They've all got backbone, lots of backbone, because you need it to throw big, heavy crankbaits, big, heavy swim baits, but they've all got tip. They've all got enough tip on them that you don't, you know, it allows the fish to eat before, you know, you pull the hooks away from it. Right. So I, I, I thoroughly enjoy what we've done. See here, hardcore, hardcore. It's tied on for Pickwick today. I just bought that lure. Yeah, it's a it's bad dude, man. And yeah, I can, it looks nice. I can take this, and you see it's got mud on the bill from today. That mud come out of 23 Did you drop it before you got in the boat? No, it come out of 23 feet of water. I can take this crank four on 12 pound Yoziri top knot and long line it and make this bait touch the bottom in about 26, 27 feet. Of wow. Water. So, and it's a, you know, it's a smaller profile. So fall fish, they've been beat on all summer and you know, seven, six, you don't think about throwing a 14, 15 foot crank bait on a seven, six, but it's got a soft enough tip that you can do it. And, you know, and, and this is this has been the money maker the last month or so right here though. This is the seven two spinning rod, but and it's still still got a drop shot rigged up on it. We still throw them at Pickwick too in the fall, but it's the whole line of rods was developed by the fishermen for what their strengths is. Like Timmy Horton did, I know he did a different cranking reel and he did a seven three, and I. I I'd have to go through the whole list to, to know what everybody yeah. done, but everybody <laughs> built their rods based on what their strengths in fishing are. So I, I think it's pretty cool that you get, you get what we like to do the way we like to do it. Right. That's, That's awesome. awesome. I like the, the good, look, good looking rods and I know they got, that they, they've got nice sensitive tips. Now, speaking of that spinning rod, and I know you did a lot of damage with that on Sandusky out yeah. there. One thing that I really took from your weigh-in in particular, when they were announcing you, talking to you, they talked about one of the things you're most well-known for, and that's your electronics scheme. You're an electronics wizard out there, and we see all see from your shirt, you're a Garmin guy. Yeah. Uh, how important were your electronics, or how important are electronics to you in anything that you do out there now? You know, when you go to a place like the Great Lakes or the Tennessee River, I mean, obviously Tennessee River in January, February, March, electronics aren't quite that important. But once those fish move offshore, you know, say late April, May, they, they stay offshore until mid-October, basically. So, you know, it's, 
anytime that the fish are positioned on anything deeper than say six or seven feet of water electronics are a hundred percent important they're not important they're imperative you know even even grass fishing if you're if you're less than five feet of water fishing grass if you can't stay on that grass edge and and fish the grass edge then you're lost out there i mean okay. the only time you don't need electronics is if you're going down the bank flipping and if every other circumstance basically in the bass fishing world you need electronics but going back to ohio i mean without them i wouldn't have caught anything that i caught i mean i i, I caught the first two days I, I stayed over on erie and i was fishing individual rock piles out east of, of sandusky and those are all rock piles that you find on on you know side him and side scan and you know it's it's very very easy to do oh, i say it's easy it's not the finding them is the easy part. The time that you spend doing it is yeah. drive you crazy. But well, you know, I've heard a lot and a lot, a lot of the videos that I've done, uh, even for a lot of you guys, when we do videos on electronics, I always get those comments from, from a couple people. They're like, I didn't have electronics. I've never had electronics. I don't need electronics. It doesn't, you don't need electronics. Well, I'm telling you, the people that say that are the people that have never experienced it. That's, right. that's just the truth to it. Well, and you know, Garmin's taking it a step further. I mean, you know, everybody's got, you know, we got side view, we got clear view, which is our down view. But the one thing that everybody's got that. I mean, everybody's got some type of some some yes. type of scanning right. mechanism, and everybody's got two D. But what Garmin has done with this whole live scope and pan optics has it's taken right. it to another level completely. Right. I mean, all those rock piles on Lake Erie. I could see every fish on live scope. I mean, I could literally troll from one rock pile to another rock pile to another rock pile. And you see the fish before you got to them, you pitch a drop shot over there with that bio bait leech and don't, I mean, if there wasn't a fish, there's no need even pitching to them. But the, so, the day the live scope was probably the most important was day three when I made that run over to St. Clair. You know, St. Clair is different than, than Erie. I mean, Erie, you're, you're fishing structure. You're fishing like individual rock piles or, you know, individual rows. You go to St. Clair, it's all sand grass. You got to be in the sand grass. The smallmouth live in the sand grass. But the, the thing about the grass is you think, well, you can't see, you can't see fish in grass. Well, dude, I'm telling you with that live scope, you literally get on the troll motor, you turn it up to about seven, you troll around, looking, 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 and you see a fish. And when you see a fish that's sitting up on top of the sand grass, you pitch a drop shot over to it, and you catch it. But when you do that, you hit anchor lock, and you start fan casting because that fish ain't there by himself. They don't live there by themselves. That's right. So, so you, you catch six in a row, then you they stop biting. You troll up, you find another one, you anchor lock, you catch it, and you catch four or five more. It's just it's hard. impressive. It's incredibly hard. impressive. It's something, you know, that literally is a true game changer. People like to throw that word around all the time. It is a game changer. It absolutely is. It's like playing a video game, you know, you can see those fish. But not only do you find the fish, you get to see how they react to your base as well. You know, if they're coming up and looking at it, you see that, and they're not hitting. You know, there's a reason. So you get the chance to switch up a color or switch up a leader length or something like that. Color that change. Would never have known before. So I've been sitting here quietly, like real quietly. And Jason, I agree with everything you say. You know, the, the live scope is amazing. But I'm going to throw a monkey wrench into it by two words. John Cox. Yeah. <laughs> Here's what I'm going to tell you. And John ain't going to like this. Me and John caught them off the same place the first two days. <laughs> and I yeah. promise you, I was using mine. And uh, he's he's got he's got electronics on his boat now, too. So. Finally. Finally, yeah. right? Yeah. Finally. yeah. So we literally, literally the first two days of that event, Cox and I were sharing fish. And then day three, he caught them there again. And I ran to St. Clair. And I ran back to that spot on day four, actually. And then the east wind had blown all night long that night and had it all muddied up and dirtied up. So it was, it was shot. But, but John, I mean, Hey dude, Cox is Cox is one of the most natural fishermen that we've oh, ever had in our sport. I mean, my, that dude, my point is though that, you know, these electronics are expensive. They're crazy yeah. expensive Yeah, and not but, everybody can afford them. But here's and, the thing. Here's the other thing, Ricky, you don't have to go out and spend $2,500 on a graph. That's right. the part. Like, you know, you can, Garmin has this 93S, like the 93SV, 94SV, 
Right. Know, that that unit's seven or eight hundred bucks. It'll do the same exact thing that the units on my boat will do that cost twenty five hundred dollars. Right. And that's the point I'm trying to make that yeah. you know, we don't want to scare people off from electronics because they can't afford them. Right. There are right. affordable options out there yeah. that you can take your game to the next level and fish competitive competitively with. It doesn't have to be the latest, greatest, and you know, I, I struggle with that a lot, but you don't. I mean, and and especially if you're just going fishing to have a good time. No, you don't. You don't have to go spend ten thousand dollars on electronics. I mean, you right. you can you you can buy very reasonable electronics that will do the same exact thing that you know. Obviously, we're out here running as spokespeople for Garmin and these other companies, and, and right. they're going to put the latest and greatest thing on on our boats, and that's great. We get to use all that stuff, and that's phenomenal. But I promise you, I can go rig my boat for less than five grand, easily less than five grand. I could rig my boat with four graphs and live scope and do the same exact thing that I'm doing right now. So Absolutely. It's, well, it's what people got to remember back in the day when all we had was flashers, everybody seemed to catch the hell out of them then. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. I still have one, honestly. I do. <laughs> I don't use it, but I do have it. But no, I mean, I think one of the points though is, yeah, you don't need to go to the level that you guys are, but most people don't realize you're fishing at a different level too. Right. Your competition yeah. is at the top of the game, uh, so that you got, and you're fishing for a hundred thousand dollars. I'm right. sorry, I, at a hundred thousand dollars, I want the latest and greatest out there. Right, for sure. I'm gonna for have sure. to move on, y'all, because I'm down to ten percent on my phone. So I'm all right. Hey, we're gonna wrap this thing up, Jason. It's been excellent, man. Thanks for joining us. Um, Mike, you got anything else to add? No, man. I, I think that was absolutely great. One last thing before you do go, though, with Jason. We talked about BioBait. We talked about Dual Hardcore, and we talked about your Decker Rods. Where can people find these products? Yeah, man. Ev pretty much everything you, everything we've talked about, you can get on Tackle Warehouse. Um, Tackle Warehouse, I think they have the kitchen sink if you need a kitchen sink. Yep. But, you know, also, oh, I mean, BioBait.com, you know, DuckItFishing.com. You know, obviously garmin.com they have they have a store so all, all these companies also have company stores if you can't find it on tackle warehouse you know or if anybody's got a question man i'm easy to find jason lambert fishing instagram facebook Perfect. shoot me a message man i mean if you have a trouble having trouble finding something you need i can put you in contact with the with the right people i mean i'm pretty easy to get a hold of so yeah man, just look me up that's all great right, brother i'll see you in texas in a few weeks and yeah, uh, safe travels my man Yes, sir. Michael, right. Thank you so much for coming, Jason. We appreciate right, it. Guys, PG League Fishing Pro, Jason. Le oh, you know what? I forgot. Before I let you go, yeah. Jason, I found out a neat little bit of history. You hold a record that nobody else has, and you got that on Kentucky Lake in 2018. Is that correct? Is that record still hold? That yeah, the that's that's a twenty eight pound margin of victory record. It'll I, I think it it may still be around when y'all put me in the in the dirt one of these days. That's not that's 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 a big one. It was a hundred and one. I I have made a little banner for it. It was a hundred and one pounds and nine ounces. Yeah. Uh, that is the four day weight total record for FLW history in history. Nobody's ever caught that much weight in four days. That's pretty fantastic. So guys. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the 1019, but I still think the 28 pound margin of victory is probably the thing that I like the best because I weighed in the last day, and when I weighed in, I was still in first place. So, 28 pounds <laughs> in a four day five fish limit that's a pretty substantial uh, victory level. That's pretty. Not only is he just full of incredible knowledge, guys, he actually puts it to the test, and there's proof right there. <laughs> and he knows, a, he knows your championship. A, a pair of clean socks, is all I'm going to say. Yeah, right, I'll make sure. I'll make sure. Lambert, appreciate it, bro. I will talk to you soon. Um, enjoyed having you. Yeah, dude. Anytime. I'll see y'all. Mikey, good to see you, man. Y'all take good care. Good seeing you, brother. We'll see you again in a couple weeks. See you guys. Take care, guys.